Well, good morning again, and thank you so much uh, for being. Hey, Mama. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, it's good to get back to our regular cadence with the uh, weekly Wednesday briefings, and so that is the intent again uh, this morning. Uh, I do want to start off uh, with just um, in the spirit of gratitude uh, on behalf of myself, uh, on behalf of my daughter, uh, on behalf of my father-in-law, on behalf of my family. Uh, just thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to the public uh, for your support, um, expressions of condolences, um, the calls, the text messages, the mentions, the flowers, the, pl the prayers. Uh, it really goes on and on. They were um, felt, uh, seen, uh, and um, it helped me in ways that I would not have imagined. And of course, um, really with the unimaginable. And so I just, um, all I can say is thank you. And I'm getting to uh, the point now where I'm able to um, respond to uh, those uh, text messages and respond uh, to those emails, respond to all of the support that was rendered to me. So I'm in the process of doing that. And um, hopefully um, sooner rather than later, uh, you and those who extended um, condolences and sympathies to me and my family, you will hear from us directly as well. Um, and I really appreciate, um, I appreciate you all in terms of the media, uh, the way that you respected uh, my husband's life, uh, respected his contributions to society, to this city. Um, and um, I appreciate that. I really do. And as the first gentleman, and it's like, wow, he was not only the first gentleman, but he was the first, first gentleman. And I wanted to make sure that uh, he was respected in that manner uh, from start to finish in regards to laying him to rest. And I do believe uh, with everything in me that he is resting in God's uh, eternal uh, peace. I believe that. Uh, and um, as I mentioned on yesterday, you know, his passing has just restored um, my faith and hope in the resurrection, uh, but also uh, in regards to um, not getting weary uh, in well-doing. So it was more of a recommitment for myself uh, in public service and one that my family as a whole has been committed to in this community and quite frankly, wherever we are. I can speak for myself on that. Now, business at hand, I always start with public safety and uh, year-to-date stats and uh, using the preliminary data always from the New Orleans Police Department. And I'm starting through August 26th, comparing 2023 uh, to 2022. Continue again to show progress. Uh, total crimes against persons remain down at 18%. Murders are down 24%. Armed robberies remain down 31%. A non-fatal shooting incidents remain down 15%. Non-fatal shooting victims remain down at 17%. And carjackings remain down at 43%. Now, looking at August stats, comparing August, uh, specifically August 23 with the year of 22, it just also demonstrates how our proactive and innovative strategies and approaches uh, to curbing gun violence that we're moving in the right direction. I pull it all the way back uh, to August and July of last year, uh, taking the time to go to every single roll call, listening uh, to my platoon, boots on the ground, and also uh, with leadership. As a result of that, we have put in sound practices, uh, policies, and continue uh, from the former police chief to the current interim police chief and wanting to continue the progress that continues to be demonstrated. Total crimes against persons down 20%. Murders are down 61%. Again, looking at August, August 23 compared to August of 2022. Non-fatal shooting uh, victims, 21% down. Armed robberies, 26. And looking at vehicular burglaries, specifically 43% 
uh, down. Analyzing crime data for each month of 23 also shows our progress in decreasing crime rates across uh, the city of New Orleans. Uh, the month of August had the fewer vehicle bur burglaries. Remember, this has always been uh, something that has been at the top of the list in terms of percentages. And so seeing fewer uh, vehicle burglaries and auto thefts proves that we are on the right track. Um, as I always say, it doesn't mean that we have not experienced or our people haven't experienced being victims of crime in the city of New Orleans. So definitely do not want to overlook that and want to continue to be uh, empathetic um, as well as supportive relative on the victim side and ensuring that justice uh, prevails. Summer heat, uh, as you know, excessive heat uh, we've seen on earth, but also in the city of New Orleans. You know, on August the 8th, I did declare an emergency declaration uh, that was then followed by our governor, uh, John Bell Edwards, that also unlocked additional resources, you know, for us to respond in a timely manner uh, to what we're seeing on the ground. Um, any significant power uh, utility disruption while under extreme heat conditions, as you know, and as we've been saying, will likely greatly increase uh, the danger uh, of injury or death to our public, to our community. So again, wanting to stay focused on this, not taking it lightly at all. I want, I want to encourage residents to continue uh, to visit weatherwise.nola.gov to find localized updates on weather conditions where you live in the city of New Orleans. Parts of Louisiana, as you know, and what we're saying due to this extreme heat, um, of course, including New Orleans, are 20 inches below their average amount of rainfall. Uh, now, it's, it's interesting when I talk about the lack of rainfall, but then it also reminds me over a year ago when I'm talking about we had the most uh, rainfall that this city has seen, which only speaks to how conditions are just in flux throughout, again, being on the front lines of climate change. 4,508 acres have burned in August alone uh, in our state. And over 740 wildfires have burned so far this year. These fires, we know, that have caused millions of dollars of damage. And so what uh, we are doing and following really uh, the lead, we know that due to the extreme heats, uh, the State Fire Marshal, as well as the Agricultural Forestry Commissioner, has uh, said that, hey, we have to cease any private burnings that are happening within the state. And of course, uh, private burnings shall be allowed only um, allowed by the permission of the local fire authority. So again, working directly uh, with uh, my chief on the ground, Chief Nelson, and local government. So as we look at this and look at what's happening across the state and moving into a holiday weekend, we do not uh, anticipate saying to our residents that you can not have a barbecue and the like. So striking up or firing up uh, your barbecue pits and the like is something that we um, will allow. But of course, uh, we want to discourage. Again, it, what's happening is real. Also, from my public safety meeting on Monday, I have authorized um, the um, use of uh, our people our greatest assets to the city of New Orleans to therefore be utilized um, at the approval now of my chiefs, but to be utilized to help uh, other parts of the state uh, fight these fires. And so that's something uh, that I've made very clear uh, to my team on Monday and what's happening now. Uh, the chiefs are going through and really working with uh, the men and women uh, associated with our public safety teams and will de determine who is eligible, who wants to go uh, forward and help. And so as we um, develop the real complement in terms of who will go, we'll let you know about that. But New Orleans, we're always, always focusing on how we can also help our brothers and sisters across the state, but even, you know, as it relates to across uh, this country. Um, we know what's happening in Florida. We're not taking it lightly at all. Again, uh, it could be us. And so our, our hearts, our, our, our focus, our prayers, and also in, in our ability to respond and to help, we will absolutely do that. Shifting gears a little bit, 
Now, on today at 1 o'clock, you know, I will uh, host a, um, an official launch of a new uh, graffiti abatement uh, program. It was one that we created um, almost, it feels like, a, um, a year ago. But we've been working on, and it's been a hallmark, I would say, of my administration of wanting to clean this city up. Um, free it from litter, uh, litter uh, free it uh, from, of course, graffiti uh, and any uh, type of, of trash and debris that gets in our people's eyes. We want to ensure that this city is clean and it is vibrant and it is, one, demonstrating that we are a place and a destination not only to visit but want to live and to do business uh, as it relates to the economic uh, growth of this city. Uh, so we're going to be targeting the most severe uh, instances uh, as it relates to buildings uh, throughout the city and or wherever gra graffiti is found, we're wanting to tackle it. But of course, uh, wanting to start with uh, the most egregious uh, areas in the city. So I'm excited about that. Also, I wanted to just speak uh, about a couple of things. My administration just continues to take bold action and demonstrate true leadership, especially relative to Plaza Tower, uh, pushing back 100 percent against uh, the inspector general, the IG, who released a report uh, on August the 21st uh, claiming code enforcement has not placed enough enforcement actions relative to Plaza Tower. I push back 100 percent simply because this administration has been the administration over the history, over 30 years of that building being in the condition that we've had to live with uh, for this time. We're the first to levy and find judgment relative to Plaza Tower, and we will continue to not only hold uh, the ownership accountable, but work with ownership. If it was so easy to redevelop, we wouldn't be sitting here with Plaza Tower again in the community, in our city right now. So we know with balance, everything uh, will get done, and this is how we're taking this approach. Again, we're wanting to ensure the city is asking the owner to repay over 90000 for the cost of barricades as well as lost uh, revenue associated with uh, Plaza Tower. And this is also aligned with the meters being closed around this particular area. However, again, the owner's attorney uh, has said um, uh, the exact amount owed to the city will be determined in the upcoming weeks, and the judge has uh, a, a pretty much stated this as well. So we are going to follow uh, the judgments that are set that come out of, again, from holding the property owners accountable, but again, working with ownership every step of the way. Code enforcement, just again touching on that, brought Plaza Tower to a hearing as early as November of 2021, got 11 guilty findings from that hearing of 4,200, uh, we know, fines occurred. However, the case, again, was appealed to the Civil District Court, putting the process on hold. This is why you have to work with, and things are even more complicated at times uh, than they seem. But we're working through the complications in order to, again, assure balance, accountability. And at the end of the day, we want Plaza Tower back into commerce. We want it back on the tax rolls, and we want it to reach its fullest potential uh, in our city. And as I mentioned, again, just in constant communications with uh, the ownership. And the city remains unwavering in our commitment to fight blight in our city, reduce violent crime, clean up our communities, and of course, as I mentioned, bring properties back into commerce. We've seen over 90 properties this year as of August the 28th. We're putting the resources where they need to be placed. Uh, we have gotten the approval, of course, by the New Orleans City Council for these budget allocations. And of course, 10 million uh, invested in code enforcement, and we're seeing the results of that and we are hiring. Um, so that's something that we're always wanting to push out. But this puts uh, code enforcement on track again to surpass 2022 stats by nearly 30 percent. Nothing to shake a stick at at all. You want some water? I got some. Okay. <laughs> 
I must see you messing up the phone shway up in here. I haven't seen you in a minute. So summer employment, I wanted to touch on that. I'm going to turn it over to John in a minute. But before I do, uh, summer youth employment. Okay, so on yesterday, we know that the city council uh, had a uh, committee uh, hearing on this matter. You know that the administration leadership uh, was present and accounted for, accounted for uh, at that hearing. We also learned, of course, um, and we've demonstrated that more and more youth, as we work through the challenges that were presented, um, that more and more are getting uh, their pay. Uh, we will ensure that 100% of our young people that offered and rendered services to the city of New Orleans through our summer youth employment program will be paid. One thing that I remain uh, very much proud of, of the fact that we have been able to uh, really hire more than we've ever done before. That's come with challenges, of course, but again, giving our young people the experience, uh, giving them the opportunity was the priority and just continues to be uh, that uh, priority and the increase in the number of young people that we were able to provide this opportunity was nearly at 120 percent so again nothing to shake a stick at of course 98 percent of our young people were uh, paid on time but again uh, that doesn't excuse nor overlook the fact uh, that some were not and we are making sure that that happens and we're committed to doing so I also just wanted to end on this. I'm excited. Normally, I have on my NASA pen. I couldn't find it this morning. That's, uh, you know, I couldn't find it. I wanted to, to wear it simply because, you know, I've been pushing very uh, heavily uh, NASA, uh, showing and demonstrating that it has a place uh, in this city. Of course, NASA, NASA Mishud. But I wanted uh, that uh, to be front and center when you whether you were flying out of uh, Louis Armstrong International or flying into, for people to see uh, that STEM, uh, that science, that engineering, that NASA is in the city of New Orleans and the impact that it's having not only here has a greater impact nationally and even globally. But it is uh, something that we should be proud about and something that I'm just happy. And we'll have more about this, but just seeing the interactive display uh, under construction at MSY is something that I'm very proud of. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Take some water and we'll get in the Q&A. Again, one question, one follow-up. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, can you talk about the police chief search? Have you made a selection? And then can you just walk us through the process so far? Has it been somewhat of a, a frustrating one dealing with everything you've had to deal with? Okay, so um, frustrating, no. Uh, wanting to get it right. Uh, it is a very tough decision, uh, and it, it requires um, a level of focus uh, and the ability to not, to not be distracted um, by the existing environment or things that have come in in the wake of it. Um, what I will say is that I've had the opportunity to host my own uh, interviews uh, with candidates, which also includes uh, Mr. Franklin. I think I've talked about that, that stepped outside of the uh, IACP process to one that I did want to sit down with. So I've done that. Now I am in the process of, again, um, making my decision. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is a um, very important one, and I'm going to give it all the attention uh, that it deserves. You'll be hearing more from me on that, um, and that's what I have to give you right now. And um, we have some very impressive um, candidates, those that I was able to meet with, and, um, and that, I believe, was the intent. Uh, the intent of the New Orleans City Council that called for a national search uh, and something that I embraced uh, fully. Uh, also, making sure that we had a, of course, robust community engagement through the process uh, that culminated in a um, external um, panel as well as an internal panel. So I am weighing on all uh, of those factors that have been embedded in my process and will render a, a decision shortly. Leah with WWL, do you have a question? Yes, um, staying on the front of the search for the police chief, uh, saying that you were uh, embracing the national search and the support from the city council, you 
just that there was some concern from the city council members asking for more information when it comes to how those candidates were narrowed down. Has any of that information or will any of that information be turned over to the council if they can see how um, those candidates were narrowed down? Sure, that was weeks ago. And that was by the consultant that was hired to manage the search. Uh, so IACP immediately uh, turned over, of course, information, always being transparent and engaging the New Orleans City Council in the process from start and even to finish, which culminates, uh, as you know, as a uh, confirmation hearing. Uh, and so the City Council is still embedded uh, in the next step or the next phase, I would say, of, uh, of the process. And so, yes, information uh, was shared. Um, what I will say is that there's no shoe in for anyone uh, and that I have made sure that I'm conducting a very fair uh, uh, process uh, and giving candidates who um, want to lead the New Orleans Police Department a fair opportunity and a fair shake. And that includes our interim chief, Whoopford. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. So as it relates uh, to the consent decree, because this is a consent decree issue, um, I am where I've always been uh, as um, in terms of staying in lanes and, and sticking with the scope of authority. Uh, one of my issues uh, with the handling of the consent decree based on the judge as well as the monitor, again, stepping outside of their lane, which they continue to demonstrate uh, that they focus on things that are not aligned with the consent decree, picking and choosing a particular investigation, again, outside of the scope. So what I will say is that I'm looking for bias-free monitoring uh, and just, uh, just bias-free relative uh, to the handling of the consent decree. Do you think there was any special treatment involved in this investigation? Special treatment, what do you mean? So what I will say is that from the PIB side of it, absolutely uh, handled uh, effectively. Uh, it went even further, uh, I would say, than um, uh, most investigations have been. Uh, and when you talk about the handling, I would say more so on the outside, meaning those agencies that have no authority relative to uh, the investigation. That is where I have the problem. That is unprecedented. That is bias. And that is not fair. Did you mention, were you going to be there tomorrow or not? I, I had meant to ask that question. I do not participate in uh, hearings relative to the consent decree. I have the leadership of the New Orleans Police Department, the, the uh, city attorney's office, and attorneys that are assigned to manage the consent decree on behalf of the New Orleans Police Department, but more importantly, on behalf of the city of New Orleans. So not speaking specifically to what you're saying, so I don't agree with you at all. Like, I don't know. You're not being specific. But what I will say, you're talking about years. I'm just hearing of that. But what I will say relative uh, to our young people um, and um, this unfortunate, very unfortunate uh, incident relative to their pay and being paid timely, which has a lot to do not only with data collection, data collection met, uh, methods, as well as organizations or agencies uh, that are not necessarily under uh, the city of New Orleans. They are ancer ancillary agencies. And so we are going to, and we are doing everything possible to not only address the data collection, making sure that we have accuracy there, but getting checks cut to our young people. That is the priority, but also 
the priority is on ensuring that we have systems in place moving forward and particularly um, data systems that can manage um, the various agencies that we want to allow for them to hire young people for summer employment in the future. So we went very deep on this and we went deep intentionally, meaning deep expanding the scope of inclusion and that's why we were able to employ more young people than ever before and sometimes with that you're just wanting to get them signed up and give me that paperwork you know later get it later we just need to get them in the queue but what we're going to do is build out a, robo a robust uh, system data collection system so that we can manage more effectively and at the end of the day get people paid on time Well, you know, any time offering or engaging the legislative auditor, you know, I'm not against any investigations. I think that um, this particular city council, that's all they've been about, quite frankly. Uh, and it's been a waste of time. Uh, it's been a waste of money. But at the end of the day, if it proves that practices are effective or even practices can be Im improved upon, then I'm all for it. So we're always looking for my team, my administration, always looking for solutions. Uh, and we will continue to be solution focused as well as solution uh, driven, period. I don't know specifically what you're talking about, so I'm not going to respond specifically to what you're bringing up to me. So what I believe is that if there's any uh, issues uh, that we need to comb through, we're committed to doing that. So no one's hiding the ball. No one's not wanting uh, to uh, right or wrong. Uh, no one's not willing to go as deep as necessary to ensure that everyone uh, is paid accurately and timely. I believe that my administration, based on uh, things that we have put in place, speak to that and we'll continue to improve every every step of the way as again as we've demonstrated again one question and one follow up natasha with life safe good morning mayor um you, you talked about fewer good morning. vehicle burglaries and auto thefts um in august this year compared to last i know that's something that a lot of people in the city are worried about and have become victims of what specifically is the NOPD doing to target that and also bait cars which we've talked about before where are we Sure. So the bait uh, car, um, you know, we are wanting to embrace uh, that um, innovative approach and in what we have seen in other uh, municipalities. That is still a work in progress uh, and it's one, again, ongoing. So I am confident uh, that we're going to get there because the focus just remains on that as a potential uh, solution. While we uh, wait on that because there are multiple tools right that we can use and we are deploying uh, that have proven to be effective just based on the stats that we're talking about progress being made and it is simply utilizing the data uh, in real time and our police department our officers making adjustments uh, in real time and we've just seen how that has um, resulted in fewer uh, burglaries uh, fewer threat thefts I'm sorry? I'm sorry. David Franklin, uh, who you interviewed uh, for the NOPD job, uh, did he confirm that he would take the job if it offered to him? Uh, no. Okay. Um, did he uh, indicate as to why he had dropped out to begin with? No. Carly with Axios. Good morning, Mayor. So with the graffiti initiative that you're going to be with today, you mentioned it's going to be targeting some of the most egregious instances in the city. What do you consider? Oh, I mean, you can go, you can ride around the city and you can see uh, graffiti on private uh, buildings as well, uh, public property, you see them uh, on walls uh, throughout the city. I would say this program is to tackle graffiti throughout the city. So it's not just in a specific area of the city, but of course, um, the contractors that have been hired will do uh, their assessments and we'll come up with the areas of focus on the front end, uh, but also with that, uh, develop a strategy uh, that is aligned with what I know best practices say. 
and that is when you're talking about removing graffiti, you have to do it swiftly and you have to be consistent. Once you remove it, chances are if it comes back, you have to immediately remove it. So we're going to uh, be deploying these strategies in hope uh, that we will see progress, you know, from month to month. We know that it will not happen overnight, but again, uh, this is something that we are aligning with best practices, much like, you know, New York, I would say, when uh, they tackle graffiti on uh, the subway. Every time a car went into the station, if it was graffitied, it was painted before going back out. It's kind of like that same uh, concept, but it's not uh, something that um, it's going into a, you know, going into a little storage area to paint. It's all open to the public. Mm -hmm. there going to be a delineation between like street art, like if people got a mural painted on the side, hired street artists to do that, are they going to be able to ask it not to be done? Well, first of all, culture is a part of our economy. It's who we are as people. And it's something that we are investing in as a city. And so clearly we're not wanting to destroy public art but definitely as it relates to um, graffiti that we know that doesn't speak to the charm nor character of the city of New Orleans. Last question, Jordan with WGNO. I wanted to commend your strength for returning to work because grief can be paralyzing, so I want to commend that. The 2% of kids you said that have not received payments, I'm sure even some of those kids in the 2% are receiving those payments. But do you all know when all of those teens who worked over the summer will have received paychecks? Is there like a deadline? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So every day is a deadline we shoot for. And that is to make sure that we have not only accuracy in regards to data, that also is aligned with the funding sources that we use um, that can then trigger payment. So we will continue to work directly with uh, all parties to ensure that our young people are paid. Again, the good news is that the opportunity is something that we were allowed to provide. Uh, and although the payment is slow, uh, it will be 100%. And it does speak to not only the character of our young people, but just being, um, I would say, developed, you know, in terms of living, just, just living. You know, things happen. And when they do, you just stay the course. And I just commend my young people for that. I really do. Um, but, um, you know, being someone who started working at the age of 14, I know that the experience, that hand-on experience, will be more beneficial to them more than any, you know, more than ever. I do appreciate um, uh, you putting a focus even on grief. Um, I'm working through it. You know, I'm working through it, and every day is a different one. Uh, and I'm working through it, of course, personally, but with, as a mom. You know, and this is my first experience with that. I did lose my father. My dad died at 47, but I was, you know, I was 25, but the impact's still there. Um, but um, it's still different. And then when I received a public records request on yesterday asking for uh, how many days did the mayor take off, you know, to because of the loss of her husband, you know, like, wow, you know, nothing to hide, no problem. But as mayor, I don't have any days accrued in terms of vacation or bereavement or uh, I don't stack up time like that because I'm not, although you say I'm an employee, I'm really not as it relates to those types of things. But I got into other things that you need to ask me about. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you so much.